Take your Bible, 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Yeah, you pray for me today. My, uh, like I said, I feel great, but I've, my mind is just going different directions today. Pray that I stay on the message. Maybe I shouldn't feel so great. Maybe I preach better. 2 Chronicles chapter 30. God's been laying this message on my heart all week. And um, just kind of giving me little things here and there. And I thought, well, okay, if God wants me to preach that, I don't mind. But I may have to kind of detach from the little series I've been going in about Hezekiah. Well, lo and behold, I looked, and it's right here. And so God knew that all along. God knew how to put it all together, and, and uh, it was a joy. It's, um, I was actually going to focus on the latter part of Second Chronicles 30, and I hope you're reading this throughout the week. I hope you are, because it'll, it'll help you understand where I'm going with everything. Eventually, something... They're having revival, but something bad's about to happen. And I mean it's bad. I'm talking killing everybody bad. How you doing, darling? She just looking at me. Yes, I'm going to preach right to you this morning. I sure am. Yeah, I know it. Anyway, that's got me all messed up now. Um, what was I saying? Something bad's going to happen. Something, I mean... Killing everybody in Jerusalem bad. Because that's what they would have... They would have either killed them all or taken them out of the city, put them in bondage, and took over the city. And, and I have a little theory that all the time that Jerusalem was attacked... Why Jerusalem? Jerusalem was where the temple was. They still had the temple at this time. And at Hezekiah's time, at this time in Hezekiah's reign, they still had the table of showbread, the, the candlesticks, and the Ark of the Covenant. And you remember the Ark of the Covenant had been stolen once before by the Philistines. They went and took it to their God. Their God wanted God's throne. That's what the Ark of the Covenant represents. It's God's throne, and their God wanted God's throne. Now, can you think of a God that wants to sit where God is sitting right now? Bible tells you about it. Absolutely. So that's, that's always when I think of what is coming to Jerusalem. That's what I think is going on. Now, there's a big, big prophecy picture in that. Because where is now the throne of God? It's in the temple of God, which is here. And that same God wants to sit on the throne that God sits on. You understand that now? So that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Something bad's coming to this world. How many of y'all believe that? Something bad is coming. The time to fall back is not now. The time to move forward is now. And decide whose team you're going to be on. Now, I was always the guy in school that when they went to pick people in PE class for the teams... I was always like the last third of the, the, the group that got picked last. They always chose, you know, the jocks in the school. That's what we called them. You know, the sports guys and the popular people. And then they got through the middle people. And then they got to me and some other people. So I wasn't all that keen on getting picked for stuff in school. Okay? But I know whose side I'm on now. And I got picked by the master himself. Now, I don't know why he picked me. Because I'm not used to getting picked that way. 
But he's picked all of us. If you're on God's side, he picked you to be on his team. That means he knows he's going to win with his people. You think about that. Now, 2 Chronicles chapter 30. The title of this is, You Will or You Won't. Okay? It's that simple. You will or you won't. And this is the time now where we're at. Pick a side. Choose which way you're going to go. And if you notice, coming into this room, we, we found this out in Ohio in one of the Amish stores. And I thought that would go perfectly in our church. I don't know where it would go. Lisa picked right above the door here as you come in. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When you come into this place, this is the side that we're on. Amen? Now, 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 1. Hezekiah sent to all Israel. Now, watch this. Now, he sent to all Israel and Judah. I got my fingers up counting here. He sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh. Look up here. How many people did he send to? Four groups. What does that tell you? Here's a picture of the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's what that is. Always is. All these things are in order for a reason. And he wrote letters. What is the majority of the New Testament? Letters. Epistles. Even Revelation. Jesus sent seven what? Seven letters to the seven churches. Telling them how they ought to be. Here is the king now, the king who is in Jerusalem. Guess who that's a picture of? Jesus Christ. We have the king in Jerusalem. I like to break this stuff down. It makes it easy for you to understand what's going on here. We have the king in Jerusalem sending an invitation out by way of letters. That's the New Testament to four groups of people. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the gospel. The gospel is to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Four places. See how the Bible tie out, ties all that together. Makes it easy for you to figure out what's going on. What's being played out here. Okay? That they should come to the house of the Lord. Somebody say amen. Come to the house of the Lord. By the way, the real, the real house of the Lord is up there. And Jesus sent you a letter dying on the cross rose again the third day, sent you a letter to come invite you to the house of the Lord. Amen. And you have to ask yourself, okay, God, what do you want out of this? God says, well, all I want is to feed you forever. All I want is to love on you forever. All I want to do is give you a home that's so comfortable forever and ever. All I want to do is bless you for all of eternity. What do you mean, what do I want out of this? Some people act like there's a gimmick to it. Like a trick, like it's a trap. And they won't come, they won't serve God, they won't choose God. I don't understand that. But that's what they act like. That they should come to the house of the Lord to keep the Passover. Ah, there we go. Passover was about Christ on the cross. He's the lamb. He was the high priest. It's his blood. The cross is the altar. He's offered up for the sins of mankind. Amen. That's what the Passover was. Take eat, this is my body. Take eat, drink, this is my blood. Unto the Lord God of Israel. For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. I got to stop here. What's so special about keeping the Passover in the second month? They couldn't keep it in the first month. Why? They were defiled. There was actually a law. God had gave clear instructions to the priests about how they should prepare for the Passover. And if they were defiled, if they were unclean at Passover time, they were disqualified. They couldn't do it. So what happened was, some guys in the camp of Israel, while they were in the wilderness, had to deal with somebody that died. They were unclean because they had touched this man's dead body to bury it. And at Passover time, they were unclean. And they said, we can't keep the Passover because we're unclean. But we're unclean because we had to touch a dead body and there's so many days that we're unclean. So it was like, God, what do we do here? If we, if we keep the Passover, we're breaking the law. But if we don't treat this man's body right and break the law there to keep the Passover, we're still going to break the law. 
So God, and everything with God has a purpose. It wasn't like God went, well, I never thought about that. God knew this. He set it up for a reason. Now watch this. So he said to Moses, Moses, here's what we're going to do. On the second month, on the 14th day, we're going to have a second Passover for those who couldn't keep it the first time. Genius! Now watch this. Who was it when Christ died, when he came the first time and died, who was it that missed it? Israel. The Jews. They missed the first Passover because of their uncleanness. So does God have a second one? So that they can be part of it. No, he's not going down the cross again. But that second one is for them. Now, let's take this and apply this to you, and then we'll pray. Before you became a Christian, can you ever think of a time when you know God was pulling on you and drawing you, and you thought about it, but then you said, no, I'm not doing that? Anybody? Well, aren't you lucky? Or let me say it this way. Aren't you blessed that after the first time when God drew you and you didn't come, he gave you a second chance? Let me ask it this way. Who in here, when they got saved, had a period of time after that where they know they were backslid? Now we got everybody. Well, aren't you glad that the shepherd left the 90 and 9 and went and pulled you back in? Aren't you glad that God gave you a second chance? Now let's pray. Father, bless your word. Help me to preach it. Open up my eyes to things, Father, that I have not even seen yet in this text. Let it be for their blessing. Let it be for your people's that That's all I'm here for, God. I'm not here for men to marvel at me. I'm here, Father, to be a blessing to these people. And for you to show forth your wonderful work of grace and mercy through this pulpit, through this Bible, to these people. Let it be a blessing to them. Let it be for your kingdom and your name and your glory's sake, your honor, your praise. At the end of the day, we'll lift up our heads and say, God, thank you for showing. God, God, I needed this message today. God, I needed this. Thank you, God, for giving me another chance. And Father, there may be somebody listening to me right now that knows for a fact that they're backslid. Knows it for a fact that they are. And God, you, they're here because you're giving them another chance. Will you give them another one? It's possible. But then again, you may not. Today might be the day. I pray, dear God, that you would bless while you are blessing. Help them, Father, while you are helping people. Open the door again while you are opening the door because that door is not going to stay open forever. You're going to shut it one of these days. So bless your word to these people, I pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said. If, if I remember this story right, there's somebody here that knows it probably better than I do, but I had heard this. There was a man in, in this church years, I mean years ago, back probably before most everybody here would, would not know who I'm talking about. But he was part of this church. When I started coming here, he was, I think, on the board at the time. Helped take up the offering. You know, he just did various things in the church. And then all of a sudden, he got back in the old life, drinking chasing women and all of a sudden now he's not in church anymore was well, wife and kids they were still coming 
They said, we're going to go. If, if he ain't going to go, we're going to go. So they came. And every Sunday, that man laid in bed, probably half time hung over. On Sunday morning, instead of where he used to, he used to get up, put on a suit on, and come to church. Well, I was told this, and this, again, it's been a long time ago, so I may not be remembering it right, but here's how I remember it. That one of his children saw him get his suit out of the closet and lay it on the bed. You know who I'm talking about, Mom? Stood there looking at it on a Sunday morning while his family's getting ready for church. And then directly he picked the suit up, stuck it back in the closet, went back to bed. Wasn't too long after that that they found him bashed to pieces in his car out here on 110 Highway, drunk as a skunk, killed him. I am nobody's judge. I am nobody's judge. But I've looked at that for a long, I've thought about that for a long time. Do I want to be in a situation like that when God takes me out of here? I want to know, I want to both know where I'm going and then I don't want a preacher to have to either lie about me or say, I don't know where Mike is right now. I'll be honest with you. I don't want that. So let me finish reading this passage here. For they could not keep it at that, the keep the Passover in the second month, that's where we left off. For they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently, neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem, and the thing pleased the king and all the congregation. So God had already allowed in the law for them to have a second Passover on the second month. God was giving them another chance to come into the house of God to get things right with God. God was giving them another chance. And that's where you, if you're listening to me right now, and I don't care if you listen live or you're listening Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, next week or a year from now. If you're listening to this message a year from, what day is it? August 16th, 2020. If you're listening to this, I know you're not listening to it last year. If you're listening to this a year from now, God had you listen to this right at that time to hear me say, if you're listening to me right now, God's giving you that second chance right now. Because there's a good chance if, if God has you listen to this, you might be backslid. Or God may have pulled on you to save you a long time ago and you just said, nah, I got more partying to do. I've had people tell me that. Listen, I, listen, I, listen, I know I need to get in church. I know I need to get right with God. But I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to a party tonight. There's a girl there that I want. I'm not, and I'm not coming to church Sunday. And he was honest. At least he was honest. But maybe now God's got it a second time, a second chance. He's, he's already sent the letters out to you. The invitation to come to the house of the Lord. Now, in verse 5, So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. Look, notice what I have here underlined. For they had not done it of a long time in such sort as it was written. Now, a couple things about this. Number one, it was their forefathers that stopped attendance to the house of God. In fact, it was Hezekiah's father who was king before him that shut the doors to the house of the Lord you know why they shut it he didn't want to come and people quit coming anyway so they just said there's no need for us going through this ritual every time if nobody's going to show up so let's just shut the doors because nobody's coming anyway that's what they're doing to stores all around this area because these stupid governors are lying through their teeth about everybody going to, everybody's going to die now. We got to, we got to close all the businesses. So some of these people whose livelihood 
They've been competing against Amazon anyway for the last three years. Now everybody's buying everything at Amazon and these people whose livelihoods are in these businesses can't run these businesses. So you know what? Nobody's coming. Why should I show up? Shut the doors. I'm going to go find something else to do. In fact, I'll go on unemployment. I make more money that way. But that's what happens. And no wonder, no wonder we see churches, all decent churches, having to close the doors. Why? Because nobody came anymore. I'm talking about Bible-believing, conservative churches having to shut the doors and lock them up because nobody would come. And it's hard for a pastor to just show up, sit there, two people in the pew, and act like, hey, look, we're going to have church today. Or... Churches said, well, it's all about the attendance. So if we can't get them to come, if we're going to preach this Bible, let's just don't preach the Bible anymore. And then they'll show up. And boy, they were right. So now you've got churches all over the place. That, and I, and I, I don't know if I'm right on this or what, but I think I saw another billboard the other day. One of these mega churches moving a campus down into Jefferson County. They're taking over. It's like, it's like a virus. It really is. These mega churches are moving campuses down into the surrounding counties to pull people out of those churches to have them come to the professional church that doesn't, where their song leader doesn't sing verse 2 half the time instead of verse 1. Where the Sunday school teacher doesn't teach out the wrong passage and make mistakes all the time. Okay? The, the professional church where they got everything polished and neat and clean. All you got to do is sit there with your coffee and, and just have a good old time while they don't tell you anything about God or Jesus or salvation. So you see the door's been shut for a little. They had not done it of a long time. And notice it is as such a sort as it is written. Now let me ask you this question. Let me ask you this question. Is it possible for you to fake and pretend that you're right God, right with God, but according to the Bible, you're not? Do you know somebody, do you know somebody who is saying, well, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I, but all the Bibles are wrong, that Bibles are written by men, and, and I've got my own way with God. Do you know somebody like that? Do you know somebody whose religion's on the internet? And I'm not talking about watching our church on live, I'm talking about they're getting their ideas about God from all kinds of filth and sewage on the internet, but they're not getting it from the Word of God. And they think that they're right, but according to the Bible... They're wrong. They have not done it the way it was written. And if there's anything that I found out about Jesus Christ is that he swore to his Father in heaven before he left to come to earth. He said, I will do it, Daddy. According to the book, I'll do it. He told his Father that. I'll do it according to the book. I'll do it how it is written in the book. So that's my thing. If you're going to say, I'm a Christian, I'm a born again believer, I'm going to heaven, and, I, and, and I'm, I'm against the mark of the beast and the new world order and all that stuff, if you're not living the way this book is written, you ain't right with God. Now, 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 6. There's two words here. This is the message. It's related to your will. And I'm going to talk about, the whole point of this message is to talk about your will. Your will. Let me explain that. There's two words in this passage, stiff-necked and yield. So everybody listening to me is going to be one of two. You're either going to be stiff-necked or you're going to yield to God. Every, I mean, I, there, and there's no three. There's not a third one. you either against God or you're for him. And there's no halfway number three in the middle. Am I right? So verse 6. So the posts, that is, the mailmen, letter carriers, went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah. And according to the commandment of the king, saying, and here's the letter that the king wrote to everybody. Ye children of Israel, turn again. Notice what he said. Turn again. Come back. Turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. The kings of Assyria had already taken the ten northern tribes. There was some stragglers left, and he's inviting them down. But he said, you already know what's happened to our brothers, the ten tribes. 
God's word came into effect. He judged them. The king of Assyria came in and stole them all out of the land and took over everything. Let, let me ask you a question. Are there, is there an evil group trying to take over this country? Now, I'd never do this. I'd never do this. But there's a video I watched last night. It blew my mind. Phil, that Spygate deal, do you recommend it? Shadowgate. Thank you. That's two people that's corrected me now. I'm going to have to start slapping the people that do that. No, 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 no. I need it. Shadowgate. It will tell you in no uncertain terms that they are trying to destroy this nation the way it is now to reform it in a different image. And they're using your phones. Your tablets, your PC at home, the data your car has, your watch, every bit of information that you feed to them, they're using against you. True. So, is there something trying to take over this country? Is there something trying to take over the churches? Is there something that is fighting for the heart of humanity? Absolutely. Turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. And be not like your fathers and like your brethren. You know what he's saying? Come out from among them. Which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as you see. Now you be not stiff-necked, that's group one. Stiff-necked as your fathers. Your fathers, God turned his back on them, God rejected them. Your brothers, stiff-necked, God turned his back on them. Do you want, at this point in your life, do you want God to turn his back on you? Turn you over to a reprobate? Do you really, God, do you really want God to let you go ahead and get away with all the sins that you want to get away with? Is that really what you want? Your flesh wants that. Your flesh is going, oh yeah, oh yeah. I want to have me a religion that lets me smoke, drink, take drugs, sleep with whoever I want, and I get to say, I'm still serving God. Well, don't we all want that kind of religion? No, no, I don't want it. I want this old man dead, and I want that new one on its way to heaven. Amen. Don't be stiff-necked like your fathers and your brothers who trespass against the Lord and God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as you see. Be ye not thou stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourself. That's the second group, the yielding ones. So God's got a hook in you. And he's pulling. And you're fighting. Mm. Mm. At some point, you'll either get tired and give up and let God have you, or God will go, I ain't fighting this no more. Does God do that? You better believe he does. That's what he's saying here. But yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever. And serve the Lord your God that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. His wrath is hell. His wrath is a lake of fire. For if you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that led them captive, so that they shall come again unto this land. For the Lord your God is gracious. And Do you know what he's saying here? He's saying if we can have revival here, and all God's people start living the way God wants, God would turn the heart of the king of Assyria right now. God would do this. God would turn his heart and he would say to all the Jews, go back home and serve your God. I had a dream last night that God told me, your God told me to let all you go and I'm going to let you go back home to your fields, to your houses and go back to the house of your Lord because your God told me to tell you, you need to go back to church. That's what that's saying. So who's, listen to me now. Who's got you in bondage? Who's got you in Assyria? Your sin does. 
Wouldn't it be something if God turned everything around for you and all of a sudden the draw of sin let you go and you came back to the house of God? Wouldn't that be something? Here's the question. Is that even what you want? Is that even what you want? To let go of all the sin so that it would let you come back to the house. See, I know what keeps people out of church. Somebody tell me what I'm thinking of. It's not hard. Come on. Sin. Isn't that what keeps people out of church? Is there anything else that keeps people out of church? No. Just sin. Whether it's lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or pride of life. That's what keeps people out of the house of God. Either, either sitting here watching. I'll, I'll, make it, I'll make it easy for you. Either sitting here or watching online. Because I know sometimes people can't get here. And we do this for a reason. And I know for a fact there are people in this area that I've talked to recently that I know are probably watching today. Because they told me we watch every Sunday. Now, I'm one of these like, I don't care if they come or not. I mean, I, it'd be nice for them to. But all I care about is getting the word into them and let God deal with it. That's all I care about, Wayne. Really, I mean, that's it. I don't, I don't, I don't think I, I don't have to feel good about myself if a hundred people show up. Show up, then I'll feel better about myself because I know they're listening. So whether you were here or you were watching online, you were still here. See how easy I am? I'm easy to get along with, ain't I? I make it easy for you. I'll do all the hard work. You just sit there, okay? And this God makes it that simple, by the way. That simple. But you see, if you don't want to, you won't even watch, will you? If you don't want to, you won't even watch. Uh, for if you turn again to the Lord, your brethren and children, I already read that, and he will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. Now, those two words, yield and stiff-necked, are related to your will. Let me explain this to you. Your will is your innermost desire, what you really want. It's what you really want. And I'm not talking about your flesh. I know what your flesh wants. I know what your flesh wants. Same thing mine does. And I'm not even going to bring it up. Because everybody here is the same. Got the same three things. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It's going to be one of those or two of them or all three at the same time. But let's talk about your soul. Your soul is where you make, really make all your decisions. Your soul is where your will is. Are you hearing me? And your soul is either, see your body is going to go to the grave no matter which way you choose. So that's why I'm not, talking about your, I'm not talking about the mind decision you made. I'm talking about the one you make in your heart. That's what you really want. And if you want to go to heaven, then you'll decide to do the things to get you there. Where there's a will, there is a... And that's not even in the Bible, but it is. Okay? It's 1 Corinthians 7, 37. Watch this. I'm explaining the word will to you from the Bible. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his own heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and has so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. Now let me, let's talk about this for a minute. If a young man and a young woman are seeing one another and they're going to get married, if they both determine in their hearts that they are going to keep themselves pure until their wedding day. Did you know they will do it? Is that possible? I'm not even going to ask you if you did. I'm just going to say if that's what you really wanted, 
that's what you would have done. Now, is that right? Of course, that's what Paul said. He has power over his own will and has so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin. David said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? And I want you to think about that word. Hey, listen to me for a minute. I want you to think about what David just said. I've made a covenant with my eyes. Therefore, I will not think upon a maid. He didn't say an old hag. He didn't say some 95-year-old woman lusting after her. He didn't say that. He said a maid. You know what that was? A teenage girl. An unmarried, unwed young lady. David said, I made a covenant with my eyes. I'm not even going to think about that. You see, if you have the will, God will make the way. I'm not ever going to tell you, it's up to you. You have to make it happen. I'm never going to tell you that. I am never, never, never going to tell you that. I'm going to tell you, if you will decide that this is how you want it, God will make the way. Do you believe that? 1 Corinthians 7, 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. So what, here's what God does with this. Woman's married. she got a husband. She's not supposed to leave him. So... The husband dies. She now, according to the law, is free to marry whom she what? Will. Does she have to get married? No. Does she have to get married to some guy that shows up and says, I'm claiming you as my property? Not in today's world. She can get married if she wants to or she don't have to. It's her choice. And God allows that. So, you ladies, your husband's died. Go do what you want. Have fun. Spend all his money now. Hey, man, do whatever you want. You don't have to get married. Ruin it. If you like living alone, that's fine. I don't want some man leaving his stuff around the house anymore. I'm just going to stay this way. Go ahead. But you see, it's your choice, isn't it? Uh, 1 Peter 4, 3. For the time past of our life may suffice us as to have wrought the will of the Gentile. What, is, what does this world want us to do? Phil, what does this world want us to do? Smoke, drink, chase women, men, or both. Be liberals. Vote for Joe Biden. That's what this world wants us to do, right? I ain't doing it. See, you got a choice of president, don't you? Nobody's going to make me vote for Joe Biden. Nobody's going to make me vote for Joe Biden. And guess what? I'm not. I'm not voting for him. I got a choice. It's about my. But are there people who are going to? And do you even understand that thinking, Wayne? It's like. What is wrong with you? When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of what? Who has, who's ever been drunk before? Raise your hand. You don't, and I'm not saying now, recently, but before. Did, did you do that on purpose? John, did you do that on purpose? Josiah, did you ever do that on purpose? So let's get drunk. You didn't say, I just have one, please. And I just accidentally fell into the other 40. No, you got drunk. You wanted to, right? Roy, bless his heart, how many years? 31 years, he's, his will, listen to this man. Listen to this man. God changed his heart. And he said, I'm not going to drink no more. Now, I don't know how I'm going to do that. But for 31 years, he said, I'm not going to drink that. I got a lot of respect for that man. But it's, it's about his will. He had been drugged down the deepest hole that a man can go in with, with alcohol. And it hurt him so bad that it changed his soul. 
And his soul said, I'm not ever going to let you do that again. I'm the boss now. And let me tell you, in the days that I've known him, you have no idea how close he's actually come. And God's always turned him around. See, that's your will. 1 Corinthians 4.21, what will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of weakness? So listen to this. Listen to this one. This church determines what I preach. This church gets to pick the sermons that I'm going to preach. God knows you better than I do. I don't know you what you do all week long, but I guarantee you I know the guy that does. And God lays messages on my heart to preach to people for a reason, and I may not understand it. So if I have to show up one morning, God's just been burdening me all week, and I come in here with a rod and have to chastise everybody, who made me do that? That was you. If I had to, if I had to beat Lindsay or Alicia or Courtney, if I had to give them a whipping, did I do it just because I, I like to see them scream? No, that always tore me up to have to whip my girls. My girls and I, are, I love them. And I love them. I love my boys. Don't get me wrong. I love my girls. It tore me up to have to whip them. But if I had to, they caused it. That was their will. And it was my job to change their will. See it? And how did I change their will? The rod. 1 Timothy 2.8 I will therefore that men pray everywhere. I, I, it is my will. It, listen, if I was running the country, I'd turn everybody into a born-again Christian. Because I'm tired of living in this mess. Amen? But see, I don't, I don't get that. But that's what I want. So I, what I want is to go to McDonald's, sit down with my tray and say, Hey, everybody, we're going to pray. Everybody bow your head now. We're going to pray over this meal and tell God thank you for giving us McDonald's today. You think that'd go over very well? No. Sam, shut up. Pray to yourself. 2 Timothy 3.12. And yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you want to live godly, God will provide the way for you to live godly. Do you believe that? Are you believing any of this? Titus 3.8. This is a faithful saying. These things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which believed in God might be careful to maintain good works, that these things are good and profitable unto men. And here he's talking about your will. If this is what you want, here's the scripture that will help you do it. Now, I'm getting serious now. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one. 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Now I'm changing the word. The word now is not will. The word now is would. Would, W-O-U-L-D, which is still a will-related word. It's related to your will. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So if I have to, if I or somebody comes to you and says, look, um, you know, I hate to say this, hate to bring it up, but, and I love you, but you're not living right. Now, you might get ticked off going, what right do you have to judge me? You see, what, you see where your will is? See, what, see where your attitude is? Because I believe it or not, I've had people come to me that way. Mike, can I talk to you? Yeah, what's up? I've had people do that. Mike, I'm praying for you. You're not, you're not right. Now, I didn't do a karate chop on them and do a flying kicks in the air at them and do a Walker, Texas Ranger roundhouse on them and get out of my office. I'm the preacher. You can't talk to me that way. I didn't do that. I kind of want to know what's wrong with you. Not every day, but I kind of want to know. Right? 
so I can do better. If we would judge ourselves, if it's in your will to judge yourself, nobody will have to come to you and say, look, I'm, I'm seeing something here out of you that I'm, I heard you say this the other day, and that ain't right. 1 Thessalonians 2.12, that you would walk worthy of God. See, if it's your will to walk worthy of God, guess what you will do? 1 Thessalonians 4, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and, how to, and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. And this verse is explaining it point blank. If you really want to walk to please God in every day that you live, God's saying you will abound in it. If that's really what you want, it'll start oozing out of you. It'll just come out of your pores. It'll just shoot out of your eye sockets. You'll be so full of pleasing God, you won't be able to stand yourself. You'll be so good at it. If that's really what you want, God will just fill you up with it, right? So, get with me here. What's the matter? What's wrong? I mean, I've laid it out very clear. And I'm not, I'm not speaking, believe it or not, I'm not speaking to anybody in my mind. I don't have anybody in mind here. Okay, But this is kind of the way God wanted me to lay it out. If A equals B, then how come you, which is A, are not B? Is that simple enough for you? If what I've preached is right and true and the word of God, then where's the evidence of what I just said in your life. If you are in fact an apple tree, where's the apples? If you are in fact a rose bush, where's the roses? If you are in fact wanting and desiring in your innermost being to serve and please God every single day. And we've already said that if that's what you want, God would make the way for you. Then the question is, why isn't it there? The answer is, it's not there because it's not in your will. 1 John 2.19, they went out from us. In fact, turn there, turn to this verse. Turn to this verse. Who sent me a text? That better not be. Papa John's. They got a new special. Good grief. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Y'all will run out of here. First John 2 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. Let me, let me read that again. Let's read that together. They went out from us, but they were not of us. What does that mean? They were in here faking. And they left because they couldn't stand it. Because they weren't real. See what I'm getting at? See what I'm saying? Remember what Hezekiah did? Hezekiah didn't say, stay where you are. We'll come and bring lamb sacrifices to you for Passover. That was not in the law. What did Hezekiah say? Come to the house of the Lord. Did he mean that? Can anybody make it say something different than what it says? No, that's the king's commandment. And if the king told you, come to the house of the Lord, we're going to have Passover, and you don't do it, They were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would, no doubt. See the word will there? They would. They would. They would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. We had a bunch of that happen last year, didn't we? Third John, there's only one chapter in Third John. Turn there. 
Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he receive himself the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and cast them out of the church. Look at this one. Look at this one. John's saying, if I come, I'm going to remember. There's a guy at y'all's church that has been saying things about me, lying through his teeth. Not, he's not content with the fact that he's not coming to your church. He's going to make sure that anybody that wants to come to your church doesn't get to come to your church. Joe Biden, Kamala Harris. Here's some information. My stupid phone heard me say Joe Biden, so it said, here's information on Joe Biden. Shut up! <laughs> Look at this. There's people out there that hate church so bad. They're not just content with not going. They want to... They want to not just stop you. They want it in your will that you never want to go back again. How are they going to do that? How are they going to, here's, here's a guy who wants to start going to a Bible-believing church, and the devil says, not only am I going to stop him this day, I'm going to stop him for the rest of his life so that he never wants to go to church ever again. How does the devil do that? I want to hear from you. Okay, that's one way. Huh? Huh? With what? What is he, in the, in the void that he creates in your life, there's always, gonna, he's going to fill it with something. What's he going to fill it with? Sin. Huh? Sin. Remember what I said? Alcohol. Drugs. Immorality. Sleeping with people every night. Watching porn all day long. You just start naming off sins. And I guarantee you the devil's going to throw every one of them at you until you've decided, why do I want church? I can have all this. Because when you... Who, raise your hand again if you backslid before. When you backslid, did you remain sinless? Think about it. You didn't did you? In fact, the very thing that the devil used to get you out away from God was sin. Wasn't it? See, there's only one way that this happens. Only one way. And it's the it, in, instead of the devil trying to talk you out of coming to church one Sunday, he's talked you out of coming to church for the rest of your life. He changed your will. Like that guy on that motorcycle out here. So Hebrews 10, turn here and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to quit. Hebrews 10. And you, listen, this is God, God says all this a lot better than I do, but I'm just going to help you understand it. Here's what we've seen. If it's in your will to live right and serve God, God will make a way for you to do that. But if you come up with something that you decide you don't want to live for God, there's going to be, there are plenty of things to do on Sunday like that. Mr. Motorcycle Mama out there, whoever that is. I guarantee a devil said, hey, get on that motorcycle, ride that around that church. If it's in your will to do right, you'll do it. 
God will make the way, and it'll just be the easiest thing in the world. For those, for those of us who are born again, easiest thing in the world, get up and go to church. We just get up and go to church. Not forsaking, Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Who attached this? I didn't. God did. I didn't put these two verses together. They were there. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Are, what are, are we not seeing the day here? Are we so blind we can't see what's coming? They wrote, two Obama generals wrote one of the lead generals in the Pentagon this week a letter asking him if he would be willing to forcefully remove Donald Trump from the White House January 19th because of the probability that Joe Biden will win the electoral vote. Who read, who's seen that other than me? It's out there. It's out there. They, I've seen that probably a dozen places. Two Obama generals, they were probably forced out by Trump, wrote that whoever's commander in the Pentagon a letter saying, will you stand up, follow the laws of our land, forcefully remove Donald Trump January 19th when Joe Biden takes the office because we believe there is a most likely a high probability that Biden will win the elect, not the election on, no, on November 3rd, the electoral vote. That's different. Yeah. See, Wayne, they can't change the Trumpers. And there's a hundred million of them in this country. If there's one, there's a hundred million Trumpers in this country. I'm convinced of it. So they can't change the Trumpers. Who can they get to? The Electoral College is the people who actually choose the president. They're supposed to follow rules that if a state votes Trump, they have to vote Trump, all of them. If 13 electorate votes in a state and the state votes Trump, the 13 votes go to Trump. That's how they tally it on election night. Yeah. Hillary won the popular vote. Trump won the electoral vote. That's different. And these guys didn't say the election. They said the electoral vote. It makes me wonder if they ain't got something cooked up. Back to the scripture. We see the day approaching, don't we? Now's not the time to back away. If we sin willfully, boom, there it is. Now you understand it, don't you? After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Do you hear this? You... You let the devil talk you back out. And God is saying, I will be done with you forever. I don't want that. I don't want that for me. I don't want that for my wife. I don't want that for these girls that I would give my life for. I don't want it for my sons who I'm so proud of. And I don't want it for this church. But in the years that I've been doing this, in the years that I've been growing up in this church, how many times have I seen it happen? Lots. So let's bow our heads. I told you I'd quit after this verse. The motorcycle's gone. Angels run that guy off. Now you got some thinking to do, don't you? And again, I don't, I don't have nobody in mind. Sometimes when I do, I will say it. I got somebody in mind. And I'm saying that because I want you to feel guilty. And I'm not going to tell you who it is. That way I want everybody to feel guilty. But I don't have anybody in mind on this. That's up to God. He, told, he laid it on my, it's been on my heart every day this week. Mike preaches, preaches, preaches. And there it was right there in front of me. Easiest message I've put together in a long time. So what do you want? What do you really want? Battle lines are being drawn. And what that means is there's a line and you're going to pick a team and you're going to do it right now. And I mean right now. You're going to do it today. Before you walk out of this building, you're going to do it. 
Now again, somebody might not hear this for another year, so that'll be their day. But today, you make the choice. Do you want to serve God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? Or you just want to be turned over to sin? Maybe you want to think about it. Okay, I'll be easy on you. But the longer you take, I almost guarantee you the devil's going to use that to throw stuff at you while you're thinking about it. So this morning, I'm just, I'm wrestling, I'm delaying because I don't know if I should invite you down or have you pray where you are. So I'll do both. If you want to come down, pray, you come down and pray. If you want to stay where you are, you stay where you are and you pray. Because it doesn't matter to me. It's your decision. Your choice. You make it.